So before beginning, I would just like to remind you something which seems obvious. Mm -hmm. That is to say that I will give my talk in English. <laughs> but as English is not my mother tongue, something relevant will certainly be lost. Why I say that? Um, what, I want, what I would like to underline is that today, general domination of English in conferences, universities, and other places of that kind should not be considered so innocent or a land de soi. Uh, the commonplace here is that English is used as a kind of lingua franca as Latin was used in Europe in the uh, 15th, 16th, and 17th century. The analogy is misleading because Latin did not belong to any particular country, was not spoken to by to any particular country. While English, as you know, is proper, let's say, uh, to a couple of uh, nations. I think this, we should reflect on that. Oh, no, now let me begin my talk. <laughs> uh, the title of my talk echoes uh, the title of a lecture that Gilles Deleuze gave in Paris in March 1987. If by any chance you have seen the video who was taken at that moment, you will remember that Deleuze defines the act of creation as an act of resistance. Uh, resistance to death, first of all, but also resistance to the paradigm of information through which the power is exerted in those societies that uh, Deleuze uh, called control society, Société de Control. Uh, each act of creation, according to Deleuze, resists to something. So for instance, uh, Bach music is an act of resistance against the separation of the holy and the profane. As you see, Deleuze did not define what does uh, resistance mean and seems to give to the term uh, the current meaning of uh, uh, opposition to an external force or threat. Uh, uh, the way in which I work uh, is uh, often an attempt to perceive what Feuerbach called the capability of development contained in the work of the authors I love. So even in this case, so I will try to develop this uh, idea of uh, that the act of creation is an act of resistance. So I will try to uh, interrogate what uh, remain unsaid in Deleuze's lecture. I must first say that I do not feel at ease uh, concerning the, the usage of the term creation uh, in, re in referring to artistic practice. By the way, while I, I was uh, investigating the genealogy of this uh, term, I discovered that uh, a part of responsibility uh, belongs to the architects. Architects, When medieval theologians uh, trying to explain the divine creation of the world, they had this uh, uh, example. They will say, as the house pre-exists in the mind of the architect, so God created the world uh, looking to a model in his mind. Uh, so Thomas will uh, write like this. 
Thomas distinguished clearly between the creare ex nihilo, eh, to, to create, starting from nothing, which defines divine creation, and facere de materia, eh, to make from a matter that defines human productions. But uh, as you see, the, the comparison between the act, the activity of the architect, and uh, God's creation contains already uh, this uh, transposition of a, a theological paradigm to the activity of the artist. So I would like, I prefer to speak instead of the act of a creation of a poetic act. And if uh, in my talk I will continue uh, to use uh, the term creation, um, it should be uh, understood simply in the sense of the Greek verb poiein, produce. Uh, the fact of explaining uh, resistance only as an opposition to an external uh, force does not seem sufficient, adequate to me, in order to comprehend, to understand what an act, a poetic act is. I think, I'm convinced that uh, as the potentiality which the act of creation unloses, frees, must be internal to the act, in the same way also the resistance eh, must be internal to the act of creation. Let me now say something uh, about this concept of potentiality. As you know, the concept of potentiality in Western philosophy has a long history and starting from Aristotle, has in it a central position. As you know, Aristotle opposes and links together at the same time potentiality, dynamis, and actuality, energia. And this, this opposition has uh, been transmitted as an heritage to Western philosophy and also to West Western science. And it is through this opposition of potentiality and actuality that Aristotle explains what we call poetic act, act of creation, which coincided for him more soberly with the exercise of the technai. Uh, so the example which he uses in order to uh, explain the passage from uh, potentiality to actuality uh, are simply uh, the, ar the architect, the, the flute player, the sculptor, the grammarian, etc. Uh, uh, in, in any case, uh, uh, each time that a certain techne is possessed by a certain man. But according to Aristotle, the man who has a potentiality can both exert it, realize it in the act, but also not to exert it. Potentiality, this is the genial, really genial thesis, this discovery, of Aristotle is essentially defined but its possibility of not being exerted. So the architect is uh, potential, has a potentiality because it can build but also can not build. There, there were philosophers called the Megarians that uh, objected to Aristotle that a potentiality can only exist in the act. But uh, Aristotle answered, if this would be true, then we should, uh, an architect will be architect only when builds, 
while we consider an architect or a poet eh, being a poet or architect also in the moment when they do not build or exert their potentiality. So what defines the, the mode of being of potentiality is that it exists in the form of a mastery on a priv privation. So a potentiality, or the, the man who has a potentiality must remain in relation to this potentiality also when it does not exert. And Aristotle will push to the extreme this uh, thesis and he will say, I quote him, impotentiality, adunamia, is a privation contrary to potentiality, dynamis. Each potentiality is impotential, each potentiality, sorry, is impotentiality of the same and with respect to the same. So each potentiality is at the same time, each potentiality of doing some, something is at the same time potentiality not to do something. So there is a kind of uh, specific ambivalence in each human potentiality which maintains potentiality in relation to its privation. And this relation defines, according to Aristotle, the essence of potentiality. So man, we could say, is the living being which exists in the mode of potentiality, that is to say that he can its impotentiality. Uh, he, he will possess its potentiality in the mode of impotentiality. So he can do and be because he, he, he can remain in relation which is not being and not doing. So and that now if we uh, remember that the, the example that uh, Aristotle gives for potentiality and impotentiality refers to essentially to technologies, uh, music, grammar, architecture, medicine, etc. Then we can say that man is the living being which exists essentially in the dimension of a potentiality but also at the same time in the dimension of impotentiality. Each human potentiality is at the same time impotentiality. Uh, each ability to do or to be is constitutively related to its own privation. And this is precisely the origin of the exorbitance of human potentiality. Human potentiality is so stronger than any animal potentiality because it can remain in relation with its own privation. Other animals, other living beings can only their specific potentiality, can this or that behavior, which is inscribed in their biological vocation, Man, on the contrary, is an animal who can its own impotentiality. And the greatness of his potentiality is measured by the abysm of his impotentiality. Now, after this uh, philosophical digression, let me go back to our interrogation of the act of creation. If we consider what we said, this means that the poetic act cannot be understood according to the, an ordinary representation as a simple transition from potentiality to actuality. The artist 
is not a man who has a potentiality to create that at certain moment, we do not know how and why, he will carry out into actuality. If any potentiality, if, if any potentiality is constitutively impotentiality, potentiality not to, how can we understand the passage to the act? Let's say, if the pianist, if for the pianist, the realization of its potentiality to play is certainly this, the execution, let's say, of a sonata in the piano, what happens to his potentiality not to play in the very moment in which he begins to play? How can a potentiality not to realize itself? I think that we can now understand in a better way, perhaps, the relation between creation and resistance. In any poetic act, there is something that resists to creation and counters expression. You know, the verb resist comes from the Latin sisto, which means etymologically to arrest, to restrain something, or also to stand still. This power that hinders and arrests potentiality in its movement towards the act is what Aristotle calls impotentiality, the power not to. Potentiality contains within itself an ambivalence. It is an ambiguous being, which, which not only can both a thing and its contrary, but contains in itself an intimate and irreducible resistance. Now, if this be true, we must look at the act of creation poetic act as, a as to a field of tensions stretching out between potency and impotency, to can and to cannot, acting and resisting. Man can master his potentiality only through his impotentiality. But precisely for that reason, there is not such a thing as a mastery on potentiality. This means that to be a poet means to be fully and helplessly delivered to one's own impotentiality. This is a poet, a man who is completely abandoned to its impotentiality. So the highest potentiality is a potentiality that can both its potency and its impotency. 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 If every potentiality is potentiality to be as well as not to be or to do, the transition to the <coughs> act can take place only transferring into the act the potentiality not to, the resistance. This means that each pianist has the potentiality to play and the potentiality not to play. But Glenn Gould is only the pianist who can not not play. And turning his potentiality to his own impotentiality can, so to say, his potentiality not to play. Contrary to the mere ability and to talent, which can only play, pass to the act, maestria, the mastery, keeps and exerts in the act the potentiality not to play. Let's now consider more attentively the action of the resistance in the poetic act. 
Dante, but what is this inner resistance in the poetic act? Um, like what Benjamin calls the inexpressive eh, of Zruklose's, which breaks and interrupts in the work the pretension of the appearance to give itself as a totality, in the same way, resistance acts as a critical power which holds back and restrains the blind drive of potentiality towards the act. And in this way, it impedes that potentiality consumes itself and exhausts itself entirely in the world. If creation, were on, if, uh, creation were only a potentiality to do something, a potentiality which can only pass blindly into the act, then art would be reduced to an execution of an order or a, a prescription which has dismissed and denied the resistance and the potentiality not to. So it would be really an inadequate conception of art, you know, something that must necessarily pass into the act. So contrary to a common misunderstanding, the maestria the ma is not a formal perfection. It is rather the ability to conserve impotency and potency in the act. It's the retention of an imperfection in the perfect form. You see, like the Navajo woman who uh, left, uh, said that she would left, leave a little imperfection in the tissue she was waving in order not to remain imprisoned in it. If she did not leave an imperfection in the text, in the tissue, then there would be no exit for her. She would remain imprisoned. And the same is true in the, for the artist. Eh? The maestro has to leave an imperfection. So in the painting of the maestro and in the page of the great writer, the resistance of the potentiality not to inscribes itself as an inner mannerism always present in every true artwork in every true must work. And it is precisely on this internal resistance that also critique can find its foundation. What uh, an error of taste, a lack of taste reveals is always a lack concerning the potentiality not to. An artist, an artist who lacks uh, of taste is incapable to refrain from doing or adding something. So the lack of a taste is always uh, the impossibility of uh, refraining from doing and acting. This spoils very often the artworks. So we can represent in this perspective the act of creation as a complicated dialectics between an impersonal element which precedes and overcomes the subject, and the personal element which tenaciously resists to the first. The style of an artist does not depend only from the impersonal element, from his creative power. It depends also from what seems to resist to it and almost fight against it. This is the inner mannerism, which I walked before, that always marks the style of a great artist. A, a really great artist, the style of a, a, a true great artist contains always an inner mannerism. I'll make some uh, very clear example, well-known example. Uh, for instance, uh, 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 art historians know that uh, the old Titian completely changes his style. The late painting of uh, Titians are, are so different from what uh, it used to be his uh, style that uh, art historian will say, Titian becomes impressionist. 
uh, if you are familiar with the late uh, Titian paintings, uh, you, uh, like, like for instance the Annunciation in San Salvador in Venice, there you will see that the color becomes a kind of confused magma and the brush of the painter seems to strike and in injure the canvas. And that's very interesting, Titian used to sign his painting with the formula Tizianus fake it, Tizianus made it. But these late paintings, for instance, the Annunci Annunciation in San Salvador, is signed Tizianus fake it, fake it twice, meaning uh, he made it and unmade it. He exaggerated. There is a, an undoing. Yeah. But this is also true for uh, the style of the old Goethe, <laughs> or the old Plato. Eh? The old Plato, since uh, ancient already ancient commentators say, but in the late dialogues, Plato becomes completely artificial, full of uh, mannerism, repetitions. Uh, the old Goethe, the old Goethe, according to some linguists, does not write anymore in German. Etc. Etc. This is true for always true. Eh? The, the, the late Shakespeare, the late Shakespeare, become mannerist. But another and, uh, in my opinion, even better example is um, these um, uh, allegories of creation in Kafka, where the great artist is defined but it's by its absolute incapability concerning its own art. I don't know if you remember the marvelous, uh, this is a strong, a strong a short um, piece by Kafka. Uh, it's the confession of the great swimmer. I quote it, uh, the great swimmer is speaking. I admit that I have established a new world record. But if you ask me how did I succeed in doing this, I would not be able to answer. Because the truth is that I cannot swim. I do not know how to swim. I always wanted to learn, but I never had the chance to do it. And then another instance of the same uh, thing, uh, the famous story of Josephine, the singer of the people of mice, eh, who does not know, she, she's the greatest singer of the people uh, of the mouses, but she does not know how to sing and can only whistle like any mouse can do, but even not so bad, not so good as the other mouse. But precisely, Kafka will write that precisely for this inability, she, I quote, can produce effects that no other singer, singer would never realize, and that only her ins ins inadequate means can achieve. I think that nowhere, as in these two figures, uh, the great swimmer and the Josephine, the usual representation of the art artist has been so radically called in question. Josephine sings with her impotentiality of singing, like the great swimmer swims with his incapability to swim. The fact is that the potentiality not to, uh, that's difficult how to understand uh, this concept, uh, the potentiality not to is not simply another potentiality besides the potentiality to do. It is what I will call its inoperativity. That is to say, something that results from the deactivation of the usual conception, the usual, the usual relation potentiality-actuality. 
I mean that there is an inner link between the potentiality not to and what I will call inoperativity. Like Josephine, through its inability to sing, makes inoperative and exhibits, so to say, the whistle that every mouse can do, in the same way, the potentiality not to suspending and deactivating the potentiality to shows it as such, exposes it as such. So the right way, what, I'm, uh, what is expressed here, uh, how to represent the, in a correct way the relation between potentiality and impotentiality. We must not think that there is uh, a potentiality not to which precedes the potentiality to, for instance, the potentiality not to sing which precedes the potentiality to sing and must therefore abolish itself so that the potentiality can realize itself into the act. The potentiality not to is a resistance internal to potentiality which impedes its exhaustion in the act and obliges potentiality to turn towards itself and to become, so to say, a potentia potentia, a, a potentiality which can its own impotency. Let me do an example. The work, let's say the Meninas, Velasquez Meninas, which results from this suspension of potentiality does not represent and expose only its subject, its object with him. Eh? It presents at, same, at the same time, at, in the same gesture, the potentiality through which the painting came to being. Great Poetry does not simply say what is saying, but also says the fact that it is saying it, the potentiality and the impotentiality of saying. Painting is the suspension and the exposition of the potentiality of the sight. Exactly like poetry is the suspension and the exposition of language. And I think this is the only possible meaning of expressions such as poetry of poetry, we could say also painting of painting. Poetry is suspended and exposed in the poem like painting is suspended and exposed in the painting. Uh, I am aware that the terms such uh, suspension, inoperativity, deactivation <coughs> continuously punctuate my lecture. And therefore, it is perhaps time for me uh, to try to define something as a poetics of inoperativity. Uh, a poetics of inoperativity. I know that to do that, let me just quote again an extraordinary passage from Aristotle Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, it's a moment where the philosopher is uh, reflecting on the problem of uh, what is the work of man? What is the ergon, the work of man? I quote this extraordinary passage. As for the flute player, for the sculptor, for every artisan, and more generally, for all those who have a work, an ergon, and a praxis. It should be in the same way also for men as such, if there is for men as such a thing as a work. Or should we rather say that for the carpenter and for the shoemaker there is a work, 
but for men as such there is none, because he was born Argos, without the work. So man is born without the proper work, man as such. And this uh, very interesting hypothesis of uh, a kind of a constitutive worklessness of man as such, absence of work eh, for man as such, is so disturbing that Aristotle immediately abandons the question. So Aristotle will not uh, continue, will not uh, take seriously this question. Let me try, on the contrary, to take it, to take this hypothesis seriously and attempt to think man as a being without any possible work, a being that no proper work can pretend to define. Uh, by the way, this hypothesis is not so scandalous. Eh? This hypothesis does not cease to appear in the history of Western culture. I will just quote two examples, two uh, apparitions, reapparitions, reappearance or reapparition? Reappearance, reappearance of this uh, uh, absent worklessness of man in 20th century. There are two little books, eh? just two little books. The first one is uh, the extraordinarily little book by the Dutch anatomist Ludwig Bolk. The title is The, the Problem of, of Menschen Werdung, of uh, Becoming Human of Man, of uh, Anthropogenesis. anthropogenesis eh? According to Bolk, it's very interesting uh, hypothesis. Man does not derive from an adult primate, but from the fetus of a primate, a fetus who acquired the capability of reproducing himself. So man is a baby of monkey who has constituted himself in an autonomous species. Uh, he's an anatomist. He, I will not uh, dwell on this, but he proves it from, ana from the ana uh, anatomy of man, which is similar not to the anatomy of an adult monkey, but is similar to the anatomy of a, a baby of a monkey. But then this uh, uh, fatality eh, of man explains the peculiar fact that compared, as you know, with other animals, man remain forever in a potential condition so that he can adapt himself to all environment, to all, uh, aliment, to all alimentation, to all form of activity, but <coughs> no one of these activities can define him. Can define him. So you know, so man is a, is, is a potential being eh, which, can, uh, which, which lacks any biological predetermined vocation. The second uh, uh, case, the second sentence, uh, come from a history of art. It is again a very little book. It is the extraordinary booklet by Kazimir Malievich. The title is Inoperativity as the, the Real Truth of Man. Against the tradition which sees man's realization only in work, Malievich states clearly that inoperativity is the highest form of humanity. And then what in his painting corresponds to this highest form of humanity is, you are surely familiar with this, is use of the blank, the white, uh, the all white paintings, the last stage of suprematism in painting. So, two examples of uh, uh, a poetics of inoperativity at work. I think that we can now better understand the essential function that the tradition of Western philosophy always assigned to theory and contemplation and inoperativity. 
the true human praxis is a praxis which by making inoperative all the works and functions of a living being opens them to a new possible usage. Contemplation and inoperativity, so inoperativity, you will understand, does not mean uh, do nothing, uh, inertia, on the contrary. So contemplation and inoperativity are, in this perspective, the metaphysic agent operators of anthropogenesis, of the becoming man, human of man, which freeing man by any biological or social destiny or vocation opens him to those peculiar form of worklessness that we are accustomed to name politics and art. I hope that what I meant when I spoke of a poetics of inoperativity is now perhaps better understandable. And perhaps the most appropriate paradigm for this uh, operation, this activity, which consists in making inoperative all human works, is poetry itself. Because what is poetry? if not an operation in language and on language that deactivates and renders inoperative the usual communication and information functions of language in order to open it to a new possible use. I mean that uh, divi the divine comedy and Cavalcanti's poems are the contemplation of the Italian language. The 16 of Arnaud Daniel is the contemplation of the Provençal language. Rimbaud's illuminations are the contemplation of the French language. Herderlin hymns are the contemplation of German. Gerald Manley Hopkins or John Donne's poem are the contemplation of the English language. And what poetry accomplishes for the potentiality of speaking, politics and philosophy must achieve for the potentiality to act. By making inoperative all economical, religious, social, whatever works, they show what a human body can and open it to a new possible usage. 